uh, for being with us uh, this uh, new seminar of uh, this series we hear from the CL2. So today's speaker uh, is uh, Sergi Valverde, and we are very happy to have him with, with us. Uh, he's a fellow of uh, the CLT, but he's also a head of the Evolution uh, of Technology Lab uh, uh, at the Institute of Evolutionary Biology X6, uh, based in Barcelona. He started his career with, uh, you know, uh, mentored by, by Ricard Solé at the UPF. I think it was next door, you know, the, the university which is uh, close by. And then uh, he also moved uh, outside the uh, academia for a while, but uh, luckily for us, uh, he returned to academia where now he's uh, heading this, uh, this uh, research group and he started his uh, new lab that uh, you know, was just mentioned to me uh, before. And uh, he, of course, he's an expert in this uh, uh, theory uh, of uh, evolutionary theory of technological innovation. And you can see from the title, which is very intriguing, uh, is, is, is going to talk about this. So uh, please, uh, you know, uh, Sergei, without further ado, let me uh, uh, give you the floor and uh, thank you for having to, for being with us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be here again. Although I would love to really be uh, physically there in Venice with, uh, with you. Uh, I, I can see uh, friendly faces among the, the audience. And <laughs> you know, friends of mine, basically. <laughs> so it's it's very nice to be here. Uh, I feel, yeah. I mean, I, I will I will love to to be there with you guys, but it's not possible. So we are doing this this time, but hopefully soon we will be able to meet all together and celebrate uh, this event uh, in person. So uh, today I'm going to to present uh, to an overview of things that uh, we have been doing. In, in regards to the understanding the evolution of uh, computing. And the title is very ambitious. It is something that is not actually uh, at the moment that the reach is reachable, but I hope that in the years to come, I will be able to, with, with my colleagues, to, to create this evolutionary theory, explaining the, the history and the evolution of computing. And actually the evolution of computing is, is a major uh, technological uh, transition that is still unfolding in human history. And interestingly, we use every day the ideas of uh, information technology or even algorithmic society, but there is no formal definition for, for these terms. Um, and for instance, information technology means different things for different people from the ensemble of computers and algorithms to almost that everything uh, related to the internet or even as a surrogate for, for computing in general. And this lack of consensus hasn't precluded you know, computing to, to have a massive impact in our society. And many people uh, share their lives with uh, computing devices uh, like laptops, uh, smartphones, uh, I don't know, uh, tablets, you name it. On the other hand, many people is also ignorant of uh, the evolution of these devices, besides the, the, the classic myths of Silicon Valley. And in popular media or in magazines, even newspapers or blogs, we often see this use of technology, this confounding, confounding use of technology to refer to these computational devices. When in reality, technology is a much broader concept and includes uh, many things from plows to forks, knives. So, so actually, me, just to make sure yeah. that you know, we, are, uh, we are still seeing that the first slide, is that correct? We, yeah, it's that okay, that's okay. my, I am still in the introduction. Okay, okay, sorry, just, I just wanted to make sure that, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, so these things, technology includes many things that do not have any kind of uh, keyboards, screens, or, or plaques, electronic plaques. Um, in also in academic settings, computing is, is often used as a metaphor uh, for other natural artificial systems, sometimes with the disastrous uh, consequences. So uh, what we're proposing is that this needs to be uh, properly addressed. And if you want to understand the social implications of computing, 
we need to study in the history of compu computing with a much um, higher level of attention and with the same rigor as other uh, historical artifacts. So now I'm moving to, to my first slide. <laughs> so, um, so this capacity to, to exploit technology for enhancing adaptation to harsh environments is not an exclusive property of our species. And another species are, are capable of, of doing or uh, transmitting in, in social information. On the other hand, we are the only species that we know that is capable of developing uh, highly complex technologies, including uh, electronic computers. The consequences of this new kind of uh, coevolution uh, between artifacts and, and humans has, has enormous consequences. Um, and they leave a large uh, footprint in different aspects. Uh, sorry, um, from uh, living styles and also social interactions and, and the environment. And it's not easy to predict if these interactions will be uh, predominantly beneficial or not. Um, our species evolved in, in a very different environment from, from today's uh, highly technological spaces. And this defines a, a, a new set of problems to, to our biology. Uh, so here I propose a few questions. Actually, there are many more, but these are some of the questions that can guide us towards this ambitious um, 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 project of developing an evolutionary theory of computing. For instance, what is the role of um, information technology in cultural evolution? Is there an analog of software in technology? How social interactions shape the complexity of computing devices? And finally, uh, maybe we can, by understanding, by answering all these questions, maybe we can develop a predictive theory that can help us understand when a social transition is going to take place or not. So um, one of the problems when studying the evolution of technology is that it's, it's difficult to compare uh, technological devices, uh, computing, computing devices, sorry, like this is a smartphone with older technologies uh, like, like this stone tool. In, in particular, they are both devices designed to be uh, handled um, with, with your hands, but the uh, structure uh, function relationship is very different in, in the smartphone or in the stone tool. And also the, the computer that, that sits in your table, your lab, your hand, uh, your, your wrist, and soon in your clothes, it's very complex. It has uh, thousands of, or even millions of components. And it's, it's very unlikely that a single person or a few pe people in a garage will be able to create all these components by themselves and, and, to as and, and assemble them into a, into a single uh, device. So the existence of these complex technologies, like the 6502 processor, crucially depends on the successful accumulation of knowledge and expertise over many years by many people. Even more, it has been suggested that the evolutionary success of our species is not a consequence of our higher intelligence, but is more related to an enhanced capability for accurate in imitation. And, and for example, experimental evidence points that, that humans over imitate um, much more frequently uh, compared with all, to other species like chimpanzees. So in cultural evolution, um, researchers have proposed that imitation and copying strategies lower the costs of adaptation and help us preserve uh, complex uh, knowledge. One main difference between computing and stone tools is that computing devices has experienced an exp exponential rate of change and improvement. So uh, for example, stone um, hand axes have remained stable for, um, for hundreds of thousands of years, while the number of transistors in microchips 
doubles approximately um, uh, every two years. This is the well-known uh, Moore's law. This um, spectacular uh, rate of technological progress is bounded by uh, several factors, including uh, physical constraints, um, complexity, um, population bottlenecks, as well as experience. And, and in particular, one important limiting factor is software, is the capacity to program these, uh, the, these computers. From a physical perspective, we could think of, com of programming as the means of controlling the flow of electricity within the computer. This is true for programming, but also for every operation performed by, by a human operator, like uh, playing a video game. However, if someone created a computer uh, by, uh, by non-electric means, like for instance, an analog computer or a mechanical device, these people, they will uh, still implement an, an universal Turing machine on top of this hardware. And we should be able to perform this, this exact same operations as we perform in, in the electronic uh, computer. So um, computers are not exactly about manipulating uh, electrical signals. This is not what programming is, is about. The concept of programming is tied to the description of the algorithms, not the uh, physical, uh, not to the physical substrate. This row of complexity has a dark side because uh, we have uh, witnessed that software is not keeping up with uh, these uh, hardware advances. Actually, uh, Bill Gates proposed that, that software efficiency halves, not doubles, every 18 months. So somehow, compensates for, for software complexity compensates for Moore's law. One, um, one cause of this is the is software bugs, software errors. Software is written by humans and we tend to make, we are not perfect and we tend to introduce uh, mistakes. For instance, bad designs, misunderstandings, or even typos. Books are written by humans and an intelligent uh, reader can distinguish a misspelling. On the other hand, um, um, a computer is a stupid and it, do, it does precisely what it's told to do, even if it has errors. So fixing those errors involves some kind of human uh, controls. This search for, uh, for let's say, taming uh, software complexity started actually uh, several decades ago. In the 1960s, the computer scientist Alan Kay, um, at that time at, at Sherrox Park, and also a previous student, a student of biology and mathematics, really recognized that the complexity of software was only comparable to biological systems. So Kay, uh, Alan Kay proposed to arrange software into a disjoint set of components, loosely resembling uh, biological cells, um, which encapsulate uh, data and code. The parameter arranges the pattern of communication among these cells, these objects in, in programming uh, parlance. And it's precisely this pattern of communication that produces the complex functionality. Um, this design, this complex design can be represented with a network, very similar to a collection of web pages that point to each other but instead of um, written in, 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 in an artificial language, not, not in a human uh, language. And network analysis uh, of these uh, structures, of these software designs, has revealed a very heterogeneous network, not very different from other biological systems, including metabolic and regulatory networks in cells. This, uh, actually, this complexity has some well-defined uh, um, fingerprints. One of those is the heterogeneous distribution of connections, a small average path lengths, and also high degree uh, of clustering. These uh, parallels between artificial and natural somehow blur this distinction that we tend to, to do between evolved and design, and design systems. To the extent that uh, sometimes I ask myself to what if this separation is real or not. To learn more about this universal origin of complexity, 
we need to look into the developmental process, which can be quite convoluted as any um, experience programmer uh, can attest. So um, this is a quantitative approach to, to software is not new. It's called uh, software metrics in the literature, but it has not been uh, widely um, adopted. Here, what we propose is to look at software systems from a purely naturalistic point of view and to use the tools of uh, software uh, complex networks and mathematical modeling to characterize and understand this, uh, the evolutionary process. So our network analysis um, suggests that software is closer to biological systems than to other artificial systems. In particular, um, tinkering and the combination is a widespread in software development. This is uh, well, a well-known uh, rule among programmers, the copy, copy and paste uh, uh, process. The, the role of optimization here is less evident. So uh, we can recognize the effects of planning and optimization at small and medium time scales, but on the longer time scales and the evolutionary time scales, this is uh, less clear. And for instance, think about in the long-term evolution of Windows. Um, the physicist uh, Sidney Renner and Paul Krapinski from the Santa Fe Institute, they uh, demonstrated that duplication process uh, indirectly incorporate a preferential attachment rule. And it, they predicted that it produces an heterogeneous uh, network. And actually you can extend these models that in to see that other large scale properties as modularity and other things that can also be predicted from these uh, tinkering rules. And in particular, the distribution of motifs, the frequency of a small, uh, the occurrence of a small subgraphs in these software designs um, follows a scaling law and can be also predicted with these models. And moreover, you can even predict the, uh, the, the, the temporal evolution of some quantities like the number of, of links, which in another C++ program will be the number of the directive, um, they, include, they include directives, which can, can also be predicted. And thus suggesting that even if software development is a complex process, it's predictable to some, to some extent. And I think that this is an, has not been explored enough. In particular, maybe we can use these models to guide development of software pro complex software projects, and in this way to easy and to lower the costs, the high costs of software development and maintenance. Um, in, moreover, um, there are also um, some other innovations in that happened in the history of information technology that cannot uh, readily explain in using a, a current approaches. So one of the major innovations in, in, in the history of information technologies is the concept of, uh, of Turing machine that embeds in this uh, hardware and software um, separation. And, and it was an, an unprecedented uh, event in history and, and caused uh, huge ripples in, in many different areas of knowledge, um, not only computing, but also in biology, and physics, uh, cognition, etc. So um, this idea of a Turing, the universal Turing machine embeds this idea of a programming language, which is a means of, uh, of interfacing or a much more natural way of interfacing the computer. So instead of um, giving the machine codes, codes, the binary codes that they are actual codes read by the computer, you can uh, write, you can specify the program in a much higher level notation that is more uh, readable and more easy to un uh, comprehend and understand by humans. And actually programming languages um, promote immense creativity and constant experimentation with ideas. Um, and they define a huge universe of solutions as you can see in all these, uh, in this collection of, of examples. And some of these languages, specialized in, in complex scientific processing, image management, sound processing, management of firms, businesses, uh, databases, etc. So one uh, question, one obvious question, but also the very difficult to answer is, what is the origin of 
this extraordinary uh, language uh, diversity, how programming languages evolved uh, over time. We can look at the father of modern evolutionary um, theory, uh, Charles Darwin, for inspiration. And actually networks have been a fundamental concept of ecological uh, thinking for a long time. Darwin himself uh, saw nature as a complex uh, web of interacting species, coalescing together in space and time. Actually, the only figure in the origin of a species is the is an evolutionary tree, which uh, Darwin referred often in in, in his text, mm, both as a support um, for for the sake of the argumentation, and also as a kind of um, a thinking device about the patterns that one might spare, expect to emerge from, from evolutionary processes. So um, computing systems that we have seen evolve almost organically and the structures they built are increasingly complex. So how we can, can understand this complexity? And similarly to Darwin, we would like to, to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree of computing. But there is a, a problem here because we lack a well-defined um, cultural genome. Um, this is one also one of the one of the main reasons for the persisting debate among the parallels and differences between uh, cultural and genomic evolution. Culture uh, doesn't have a genome uh, that we can use as a measure of change, but uh, we propose that networks can help us retrace this large scale evolution. So instead of using the genome that we don't know about, what we can use is to compute uh, language distances using uh, structural um, um, distances. In, in particular, here, you, what you are seeing is the network of influences among uh, different languages. So it's, it's possible to, to find what ancestor programming languages influence the design of any one of these cultural species. So for example, you can go to Wikipedia and search for this information or much better, uh, I'd like, like we did, you can go to the library of the Santa Fe Institute and spend some time there uh, checking all the, all the historical references. Once you have this network, there's another question is how you extract this uh, the evolutionary information. The standard uh, network metrics are not useful in this context. So for example, here you can see languages uh, connected by a short uh, chain of connections, languages that are actually uh, separated in time, in time of space. So um, how we can define a proper uh, metric, a proper distance? What we proposed is to take inspiration in bibli bibliographic analysis. So, in, so, so any two uh, programming languages will be similar if they are cited or they, or they, are, uh, they influence the same set of people. Obviously this is an approximation, but as you will see, it gives uh, pretty good results. Because this network is directed, we will have two measures of influence. We have the insimilarity and the outsimilarity. By combining these two metrics, into a single quantity, we can obtain an impact matrix that provides an overall measure of a structural similarity. So here, um, we can classify different entries depending on the strength. So for, for, um, for, for a given row, we can uh, select the, the largest impact and we can assume that this corresponds to a vertical um, transmission event. And the others, the other entries will correspond to a kind of horizontal transmission event. And that's obviously an, an, uh, an assumption, but it gives good results. So here you are, you are watching the, the same network as before, but arranged using this classification that I just uh, uh, compute. So, um, so the uh, vertical links, correspond to the so-called backbone, it's the entries, the highest, uh, the, the entries with the largest value in the impact uh, matrix. And then once we have this, uh, this backbone, uh, we're gonna arrange the backbone 
according to time. And then we can book back together again, these, the horizontal, which is on the red links here. And this gives a much or recapitulates and the, the history of programming languages in a much more meaningful way than using the standard uh, force, brute force, um, sorry, the spring, uh, the spring layout. So the first uh, thing that we see here that predicts this diagram is a separation uh, of, of, the, of the, the, the phylogenetic network into two families that correspond to the two major uh, families in programming languages, the functional and the imperative families. The functional uh, family of languages is rooted in the, in the artificial language uh, LISP. And the imperative family is rooted in the in the imperative um, in the in the Fortran programming language, which is uh, has been a very important influence in the in the evolution of programming languages. Interestingly, there has been um, this asymmetric interaction here. So there has been a lot of of uh, influence from the artificial intelligent languages into the evolution of the most uh, popular uh, languages, including uh, Python, Java, and Objective-C and others. Um, at the same time, the phylogenetic network map, uh, maps other interesting trends. So we can uh, see a transition um, from early languages, uh, from, for example, the structure programming languages like Algo, towards some more uh, modern languages like, uh, like C, and its descendants. This transition, transition from, from early to modern around the, took place around the year 1970. And it was also um, accelerated by some um, innovations, um, including personal computers and, and Unix, the Unix operating system. We can also see two other trends. It's a trend towards machine independence that is that these languages are becoming more and more higher, higher level and less uh, decoupled from the underlying uh, hardware features. And there is also a convergence. So, um, so many of these languages have a, a similar uh, set of traits or they borrow from more or less the same set of influences. Sorry, Sergi. So, so how do you draw, how do you define those transition lines that I, I missed them? Is, is uh, there a definition? No, this is not a formal okay. definition. It's just um, it's uh, it's based on the topology. So as you can see here, uh, see it's kind of a hub here. It's kind of a exploded and okay. has a, has um, it's a kind of a keystone uh, invention, mm -hmm. if you like, and it corresponds to having a higher degree. Okay, okay. and that was validated from you know from by closely inspecting uh, the historical sources so from mm -hmm. from external information so there is not a so okay. to answer your question there is enough not a formal definition okay thank you. Maybe, maybe, but then it, maybe we can talk about this later um in particular yeah you can also define uh, quantitative measures here so so one way to detect this discontinuity is by looking at the temporal evolution of other uh, network properties like here uh, for instance we can see a shift from in in the average um, sorry in the number of links so the evolution of the number of links uh, grows more or less linearly with some uh, um, with some scale some scale well defined uh, scaling but then at some point once c appears c plus plus appears there is a, su a sudden acceleration it's a change it's a dramatic change in the rate of recombination so that's that will be there will be a possible way to, to map uh, in a quantitative way these transitions. Um, we can also uh, test this hypothesis uh, with a null model uh, based on tinkering as well. And, and here in black, you see the real data and in the red lines define the confidence margins from a duplicated um, duplication and a tinkering model. And, and the model agrees quite well with the macroscopic evolution of the system, also agrees in the predicted uh, in degree distribution, not so well in the out degree distribution. So there is a deviation from the, from the empirical uh, distribution, out degree distribution. 
um, when compared with the um, with the um, null model, and that perhaps suggests that there are other uh, aspects like selection or other exogenous aspects are important and to explain this this uh, this trait. Um, interestingly, um, and the topological analysis of the phylogeny suggests that it's very uh, uneven. Um, and, and, and this, I think, suggests the presence of a sudden uh, bursts of innovations in, in the evolution of, of programming languages. Um, but what about the future of programming languages? Mm, a globalized world, and in particular, the ecosystem of, of companies and users is finite. And the spreading of innovations can be quite fast today, thanks to, the, to social media and, and other things. So computing innovations, I, I, I think they are subject to, to very strong selection processes. And, and one consequence of these strong selection processes is that there is a serious risk of losing a lot of cultural diversity. And that is when, when, when you have increasing returns and the, these increasing returns are very strong, a few options will be uh, selected and while the rest will be uh, um, uh, discarded. In this scenario, technological diversity um, is doomed to be less and less diverse. And this is actually the scenario predicted by, by a cultural uh, diffusion model uh, that predicts the, the empirical uh, rank frequency distribution, the real uh, distribution of program language popularity. One problem with the model is that at the moment uh, we have a strong uh, data limitations. It's not very easy uh, to, to know what are the real, uh, what is the actual popularity of all these languages. These distributions are based on indirect uh, measures like uh, queries in search engines. And it would be interesting to have, useful to have more uh, robust measures of popularity to, to further validate uh, our theoretical predictions. Um, so um, uh, one question is maybe uh, we can predict these uh, social, social technological transitions. Uh, one obstacle here is that we don't um, fully understand uh, yet what is the mediating role of demography in, in the emergence of these transitions. So for instance, in, in, in cultural evolution, the trade mill model, uh, which is based on dual inheritance theory, proposes that population size, uh, N, is the driver of uh, cultural complexity. This is a controversial hypothesis. Um, it's roughly based on this idea that necessity is the mother of invention. And critics uh, have argued that, that empirical data doesn't support it. On the other hand, uh, population size is not the only determinant of, of technological complexity, and there, um, which can be also influenced by, by exogenous factors. If anything, um, archeological and historical evidence uh, points that cultural complexity generates higher population densities rather than the other way around. So the exponential uh, growth of population in the last uh, 2000 years has been um, promoted by this coevolution between technology and humans. The higher level of technology allows to increase the carrying capacity of uh, the humans uh, being on the planet, although apparently we are now reaching some, some limits, although th these limits have been very hard to predict in the past. But assuming that this happens, this uh, feedback process happens, this in turn will produce more inventors and these inventors will create more tools and so on and so forth. So assuming this positive feedback between population size and complexity, a phase space of the couple dynamics uh, of population and cultural complexity suggests uh, that sharp transitions are possible. And so for instance, gradual changes um, will increase the average uh, cultural complexity gradually until some threshold is, is crossed and triggering um, a sharp uh, social technological shift to a higher level of complexity. This model was originally proposed by, by Aoki to explain uh, creative explosions in the Middle Stone Age, 
but we think that a similar model can also explain uh, transitions, let's say, from low uh, technological level to high technological level in modern societies, as well as in, in open source uh, software projects. So uh, finally, it's my last slide. In, as a kind of a summary, in this talk, we have uh, reviewed um, some 20 years of work on, on the evolution of uh, computing uh, technology. Um, I feel that we just uh, just barely scratched the surface. Um, and actually the vision of uh, an evolutionary theory of information technologies is still, uh, is, it remains to be fully realized. This possibility, I think depends, depends on, on find, finding a way through, um, through the maze of uh, events, artifacts and, and humans. Like in, in only historical sciences, there is always the challenge of data completeness. And in particular, everything that we have made in the past or every technology we have built, um, is, is not, not everything is preserved. And so there is a real danger, danger of losing important uh, bits of information. Just as uh, organisms uh, decay, uh, so um, too does our society. And uh, without properly preserving our past, we will be condemned to live uh, to live to, to live yes to live in a in a in a world where where we don't understand the the social uh, fabric of uh, human history. Um, so if we want to, to learn more about this, about our work and what we think uh, will be the, the, the bare bones of this evolutionary theory, I, I will recommend you our last, uh, our last work uh, done with uh, Sava Duran. And, and it is chapter submitted to the Oxford uh, Handbook of Cultural Evolution, where we uh, review um, these theories and we will review the, the we outline this evolutionary theory of information uh, technology and finally i would like to to thank all my my past collaborators and, and future collaborators in this project especially my mentor ricard Soler, uh, who encouraged me at the beginning to to pursue these and to, to study these evolutionary uh, parallels between nature and artificial systems Saba Duran, uh, Blay Videya, Daniel Lamor, who did a very uh, wonderful uh, job in analyzing these, uh, these feedback effects in the growth of cultural information. Yusef Chardanyes, uh, Niall Selrich, who has also been very supportive of his studying these parallels. Martí Ros Casals, Bernard Coromines, and now my, my, my current collaborators, uh, Michael O'Brien and Alex Bentley. I also like, like to thank the support of all these institutions, uh, in particular the ECLT, where, where this work uh, started in the, in the context of the Apache project. Also my institution, the Institute of Biology Evolutiva and the TSIC. I also would like to thank the, the support, the continued support of the Agencia Estatal de Investigación, who, who, provide, who fund, uh, funded a lot, of, uh, a lot of this work and Arcadia Vintage uh, and the CRM. So thank you very much and I'm open for all your questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Sergi. Thank you very much. This is uh, on behalf of the whole uh, uh, community. So uh, I think I, I found this, uh, this uh, overview very interesting because uh, you know, I was uh, uh, not uh, in the field uh, and uh, this is a fascinating topic in fact. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions? Because I have a question. Ah, Maria, please. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the speaker because it was a fascinating journey across um, the evolution of um, um, of computation, coding, and culture, maybe. As well, um, just a question. Um, how do you see the future? Because um, actually you, you described these processes with possibility 
of evolution of one sense and the other one. So I'd like to ask you how much do you weight um, the presence, for example, of graphical reasoning and abstract thinking. In particular, I was thinking of the Darwin, uh, very famous sketches. So how much uh, like this um, like paper and pencil aptitudes can, can have some influence on the future evolution or even of technological application of coding? And uh, uh, how do you see regarding, for example, exponential um, uh, increase of presence of new software, new um, coding languages. So if you see some possible convergence in the future, or like, for example, toward just one single coding language, which is like more universal. Yeah, thank you. Um, regarding the last question, um, we don't, we are not sure if these convergences will, will take happen or not. Although the model suggests that if the right feedbacks are in place, it can happen. It can happen that one single language will, uh, will be, become kind of a universal language. I guess that even in this, this scenario, there will be smaller niches where some specific language can, can survive, but it will be like a, like a very, very tiny. And this is something that we are already witnessed, for instance, in, in the case of C++ or C that are kind of a de, de facto programming languages for, for many domains. And in science, for instance, we have also this rise of Julia and other languages that are very, you know, have a lot of uh, followers, but we don't know. It's, uh, it depends on this, um, on the strength of this social, uh, social, uh, social reinforcement uh, that we are not completely sure about. We need, we need to develop much more robust measures of these effects. And in particular, I think that also plays a role in, in the future of technology as a whole. So a few a month ago appeared a paper in PNAS by James, James Evans and others, uh, suggesting that science as a whole is slowing down and there has been a, a decrease in the rate of innovation. We still don't know what, what is, the, what is causing, causing this. Um, so it would be interesting to, to spend more time and working, working on and understanding these social drivers and, and what are the causes for, for, for this, uh, let's say, extagnation of innovation. It's, it's a fascinating, fascinating topic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is another question so by Josef, please. Yes, uh, hello everybody. It's nice to see old friends here from Space Project. And uh, yeah, I really like your talk, Sergi, and, and I had a question concerning this uh, kind of dynamics of increase of technological complexity, which obviously one can think in developing simple models. And uh, this is what, what we usually do. But to me, this is a really, really hard problem, and I, I don't know to what extent one might might took into account might take into account feedbacks between, uh, for example, software hardware coevolution, and perhaps these kind of feedbacks have been accelerating during during the last decades. Uh, I don't know if this could be one of the key processes to, to take into account in, in future or let's say more sophisticated models although trying to keep some simplicity. Very, uh, yeah, yeah, very, very good point. I mean, one, besides these uh, feedbacks that you mentioned, but with some of them are not totally obvious to me, um, one, one, of, one problem I see here is in, in your definition, well, in the definition of complexity. So these models, these mean free models that I was showing, and, and there's a lot of literature working with these kinds of models. I think they are fundamentally uh, limited in the sense that they represent complexity with a single uh, real number, which mm -hmm. is, um, is um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a crude, it's a crude way of uh, capturing complexity. So um, there is a lot of, of work to do in this area in particular. I think we need better measures of complexity and better ways to quantify these these inter the interactions. Okay, and, and just a very quick question. So in the diagram, diagram that you showed with the uh, final radiation of all these programming languages, uh, 
one might expect that under this scenario, competition might uh, increase uh, a lot. So I don't know if actually you can, uh, you have detected it in your data or you can predict that among all this huge diversity of languages, some of uh, languages will uh, outcompete other ones. And I don't know if this, have you tried to model this or already yeah, observing the data? Thank you. We cannot. Yeah, thanks. That's a good, 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 good question. Um, this, this, this was in part the the purpose of this uh, cultural diffusion model that I was mentioning before. But uh, this model is um, is in a lattice. So basically, what we do here is we model the people, and we are modeling the transference of information and the dynamics of adoption. Taking into account that people only can have a limited amount of information in their heads, so they can only uh, and learn a few languages. So this competition for minds in the end establishes a um, a competition uh, among of of an, and a strong selection process among the languages. The point that you raised is that if we can take into account the phylogenetic information, we didn't. didn't I think this is fascinating but we didn't use this information for the model. It would be interesting to see if we can predict or anticipate this competition, the strength of competition using this information, this uh, phylogenetic information. But, uh, yeah, it would be great to do that in the future. Okay, thanks. Thank, Thank you. Hi, Martin, please. That's a question by Martin. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Hey, Serge, Hi, good Martin. to see you. Good to see you, Martin. <laughs> Thank you for the for the seminar today. It's, I, I really enjoyed listening to this. As you, as you know, it's 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 far away from from my field, so I uh, I find it quite fascinating what you're doing. So I look forward to hearing more as you go forward. Um, so I just uh, since it's not my field, I probably have a, a stupid question, but uh, just curious. Um, the uh, uh, it, it's interesting how you formulate this with the feedback through the human. In, interface with human users and things. Um, can you therefore say something about uh, the same kind of network evolution in human languages, uh, which seem to be a bit similar to what you're studying there? Is there some insight to be gained from that? That's a, that's a very good point. Actually, uh, we were um, relying on the existing literature of, uh, of the diffusion of human languages. We're trying to do the same thing with artificial languages. Um, I, I don't know to what extent they are similar, but I will really love to explore these, uh, these parallels and the, the, the differences in these two cases. Because in, in natural languages, what we have is um, kind of a symmetrical interaction between humans, which are, we can assume they're roughly the same kind of uh, agent. On the other hand, um, in programming languages, it's an asymmetric interaction because we have humans programming a computer, which is an which has a diff, is a different kind of an agent. On the other hand, there is also an indirect communication among humans because the programming language is a kind of a communication device with other persons as well. So here we have an interesting case where we have three uh, three elements, three different agents with asymmetric interactions and with different um, needs of communication. So in the case of humans, you want to express your idea to others and can be intelligible, can be understood. On the other hand, you have the performance constraints of the computer. You cannot do anything because there's limited amount of resources. So these, uh, these trade-offs that not appear in, in the case of the human language, I would think it would be very interesting to, to see how they affect the dynamics of diffusion and adoption. So that's, yeah. I mean, there's plenty of things to do in, in, in this area, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I, I wonder if I just follow up quickly is um, because uh, maybe that's just, the, the, that um, asymmetry is just due to the fact of the maturity of the language, of the computer language. And what I mean by that is if you've seen that uh, documentary, uh, The Social Dilemma on Netflix, the argument is that uh, programmers are, at Google are using their software to program us, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, and, and, and yeah, if that is yeah. true, then that is yes. maybe, if it's heading towards that, then it's just maybe uh, somehow this is an, a stage of evolution of these programming languages that will in, in fact uh, 
evolve to something else that is more reciprocal in a way. Yeah, yeah. that's very that's a very good point. Yeah, I actually in the end I think that this is technology, right? But in the end, what we are talking here is about the evolution of society because uh, it's obvious. Obviously, we can no longer live without uh, computers. I mean, they are so embedded in our social fabric and everything we do. I mean, this Zoom uh, uh, webinar is taking place over the internet. So um, it's becoming a media, the natural media of interaction among humans. And as you have said, there is a, a huge interest of in programming humans. And this is opens a whole uh, set of uh, fascinating questions about free will, about uh, extreme surveillance, and well, all, all kinds of... Uh, topics that, that I think are never ending. But yeah, you're right. I think in the end it's programming us. That's we are we are programming the society in the end. Thanks thank good. you. Yeah. Thanks to you, Martin. Nice to see thank you. Thank you, Abel. And um, are there any other questions? Because I have a question myself in the sense that uh, which was which was a, a longer, you know, the same line that uh, Martin suggested. He said I had the same curiosity. And in, in fact uh, you know, I think uh, this is uh, this is what uh, uh, you know, because I know that uh, in in in, in, uh, in semantic languages they also use complex networks to, to to sort of rationalize it, and so this is a uh, this uh, you know so the, the idea is that a complex network theory can allow you to 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 see patterns, emerging patterns, whether they are they, they are different or they are uh, that's what uh, you know that, that's what is the, and so this. Uh, Goes back to my original questions that you know on this uh, apparent phase diagram that you have. Uh, if, if you can uh, sort of, uh, uh, if you have a you know a phase diagram with well-defined order parameters, uh, you know well-defined transition lines, then uh, you can say whether you know the two uh, um, networks are you know within the same uh, universality classes or they are different. So I'm, uh, do you think that this is going to be uh, possible in uh, uh, this? this in the future, I think. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, yeah, I, I agree with you that these software designs in the end are kind of a semantic network. In the end, there is no, they are not very far. When you define an object, it's kind of a frame as well in, in artificial intelligence and in other, in other areas. So I think that um, these diagrams also reflect um, cognitive processes. So how, how we people, deals with complexity, how we manage complexity. And, and I think they open a window into these processes. So um, here I have been, well, I've been doing, trying to understand how complexity uh, evolves, trying to characterize these, uh, the evolutionary mechanisms. But obviously there's a whole uh, area where looking at the cognitive meaning of those uh, diagrams. Mm -hmm. And perhaps there are, I don't know, maybe there are different phases, or maybe we can classify simple and complicated diagrams in terms of a structural properties. I don't know. I mean, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's an, an, an non, and it has been been explored before, as far as far as I know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I don't see any other questions, but I, I did enjoy this uh, uh, this uh, discussion. So I hope that this will be more in the future. Yeah, thank you, thank you for everyone. Uh, so uh, Christmas uh, is uh, coming uh, up. So you know, let me remind you that on the 20th of, uh, of December we have this uh, Christmas lecture by that uh, this will be in person here and and uh, also online. So you are all uh, welcome to join us uh, for that event. Until that time, bye. Thank you, to, thank you to Julian, and thank you to to you for uh, for being with us.